home and is not able to join us. Okay. So we have the rest of us here though, um, the four of us, if you're not familiar, there's myself, we have Phil White, Steve Calame, and uh, Brian Holly. Um, so we're all here and welcome to all of you who are joining us. Um, so the focus of today, actually, before we get into logistics, uh, before we get into the agenda, I um, just want to remind everyone to keep yourselves on mute, which I see most everyone is, with the exception of our committee for now, um, just so we don't have background noise or interruptions. And then um, we will, you know, have time throughout the meeting for conversation, questions, comments. Um, we'll keep it fluid like that. Um, so if anything comes up, you can raise your hand. I think there's a raise hand function. If there's not, just you know, show your hand on the video. Um, and I'll do the best to facilitate that. Um, and we'll wrap up probably by five. I know there's a planning commission meeting um, immediately following this at six o'clock. So um, we'll just end promptly before that. Um, and the focus of today's meeting is um, the Ohio Reach Code, which We'll go, I'll give a little background about what a REACH code is and how it came about in OHI. Um, and we'll talk about the benefits, just kind of recap for those who aren't familiar or kind of um, listened in on the conversations earlier, well, I guess six months ago when they were happening. And then um, we're gonna talk about our recommendations as a committee to council because it's coming back for a six month review next Tuesday. So we'll be going through all of our recommendations as a committee and talking through those. And again, an opportunity to ask questions, um, any questions that you might have. Um, any questions to get started or I'll, I'll just uh, get right into it. Okay. Um, so a REACH code is a local energy ordinance. So basically cities can adopt these local energy ordinances which go above and beyond the state's um, requirements in terms of energy use in buildings. And in October, or it was November, OHI passed a REACH code uh, requiring new buildings to be built all electric. And that was actually a really exciting in that it was the first city in Southern California gas service territory, so SoCal gas territory, to um, adopt an all electric REACH code. Um, and so actually Santa Barbara is now looking at doing an all electric REACH code as well. Ojai joined now, it's actually as of this week, June 2nd, um, there's 46 cities and counties across California that have adopted a building electrification reach code. Sacramento was the most recent one to do so. Uh, and so at the time of passage in November, the council requested a six month review time. So that's coming up this next week. Um, and we're just gonna go through and just talk about, um, you know, why, why we did this and the benefits of doing a REACH code. Um, so natural gas in buildings is the second uh, largest source of emissions in Ojai behind transportation. So one way to begin, start, you know, to start winning ourselves off of gas is by um, uh, building all electric for, you know, starting with new buildings. And, um, you know, because the electrical grid is rapidly heading towards zero carbon emissions, there's a strong climate argument to be made to electrify everything, including buildings. Uh, in terms of gas use, we have uh, about half of our energy use in our homes comes from gas. So half is electricity, half is gas. Um, so when we put solar on a roof, that's great. It, it can help us you know, lower our emissions for electricity use, but it doesn't really do anything for gas use. So the major sources of gas use in our homes are space heating, water heating, and combined those account for about 80%. Uh, of our energy use for gas in homes. So the water heating and space heating, so your furnace, your gas furnace and your gas water heater. And then the smaller contributors are gas stoves, uh, gas dryers, fireplaces, pools, spas, those kind of account for the rest of that, that 20% roughly. Um, and so that's kind of the breakdown about how we're using gas in our, our homes and, um, and businesses. Um, and then the key benefits, I guess we'll go through those. Um, so there's like four kind of categories, key benefits. Um, the first is it, it's proven to be cost effective. So there's a statewide um, California Energy Codes and Standards Agency, which is basically uh, has these cost effectiveness studies, which indicate that it is less costly to build and operate um, all electric new construction. So both residential and non-residential. And we can go into more detail on that. Um, 
as we go along or right now, um, if any of my committee members want to weigh in on that, um, you're welcome to do so. Um, so, so, so we have these studies, these rigorous um, studies that go into great detail that uh, show that over the lifetime, um, so it's not a matter of, you know, this year it's going to cost you less or more. It's, it's basically over the lifetime, um, it's proven to be less costly to build and operate. Um, and I know that might seem kind of not for some of us, well, what about electricity costs or what about the cost of the appliance? I mean, these are, when we take the totality, that's, that's what, it's, what those studies are, are telling us. Um, and that's what's required by the California Energy Commission for them to approve reach codes. They have to prove cost effective. Um, so, so that's one key benefit. Um, I guess, Phil, Steve, Brian, is there anything you want to comment on that in terms of the cost effectiveness before I move on to the next benefit? Nothing? Okay. And then in terms of um, health, um, the health benefit. So um, actually, Steve, you might be able to comment on this as our air quality expert. Um, so building all electric reduces indoor and outdoor air pollution. Um, so when we think about, you know, I guess we can first take the indoor air pollution. Steve, do you want to comment on that, um, given that, you know, you've been an expert witness in, in some things on this in regard, in this regard? Well, I, I actually, I'll go back a, a bit uh, because I uh, had a consulting company in the mid-1980s and we did a major um, project for um, all of the gas utilities in California, the primary ones, um, San Diego Gas and Electric, SoCal Gas and, and PG&E. And it was a random survey of concentrations of a number of combustion gases in homes that had gas appliances. And so quite clearly, um, oxides of nitrogen, um, which is a, a respiratory irritant, uh, carbon monoxide, uh, formaldehyde, um, and a number of other combustion gases were always found to be higher in inside homes uh, that had uh, gas, gas appliances. Um, and, and I unfortunately served uh, as an expert witness on a number of cases where um, family members uh, lost their lives uh, in, the, in the night um, mostly because of uh, gas furnaces that uh, malfunctioned and uh, for which there was carbon monoxide uh, intoxication in, in, those, uh, uh, in those homes. Uh, and those are all a result of the burning of, of natural gas uh, inside homes. That risk is real. It continues to this day. Um, things are healthier in homes that have uh, all electric appliances. And there was that statistic um, that was shared, we shared, I think, in one of our reports to council um, regarding the increased risk for asthma. So there's a 32% increased risk of lifetime or current asthma for children who are grow up in homes with gas. And so, I, I mean, that struck me. I'm, I'm, I was concerned when I learned about that myself. We live in a small home, 780 square foot um, small home. And I think about the, in, the concentration levels are that much higher in smaller homes. Um, and so we had a gas stove and we're gonna in the process of um, converting it to induction, that's our plan. But when I, we have two young children and I'm thinking about what chemicals, these toxins that I've been exposing our children to, um, myself, my husband. And so um, that was surprising to me when I, you know, when we were all learning about this, um, that the indoor air pollution is really a problem. And that the other statistic I remember, it was like, I think it's like 50 to 70, wait, let me look, where is that? 55 to 70% of homes with with gas um, would be, it says the air pollution inside those homes would be illegal if found outdoors. Um, so like, again, I feel like this is something very eye-opening and concerning um, that we all should be aware of. And I think then it becomes a particularly like a justice issue when we think about um, our lower income residents who are often living in smaller footprint homes, that air concentration, those air pollutants. Um, so I think we definitely need to be uh, pay attention to this, and it's a, a, a really important reasons to move off of gas in our homes. Um, I, I will I will add to that too that um, one of the things that we found is that the worst type of furnaces are wall and floor furnaces, which actually are relatively prevalent in in the city of Ojai, uh, and even in our home, which isn't that old, when we purchased it. Um, I had SoCal Gas come in and do an evaluation, and they put a red tag on the on the furnace. It was a forced air um, furnace. Uh, there was a cracked firebox and a and a leak in that firebox, so that 
direct combustion emissions would come in through the uh, the ductwork uh, in that in that system, and so it had to be replaced before we we moved in. Uh, we've got a lot of old buildings in uh, in Ohio, um, and so I mean one one thing that people ought to be made aware of is that first of all they can get um, their furnaces inspected and for free, and, and that they really should. Uh, and there there is a a real uh, risk from from exposure and as. Michelle indicated uh, there are uh, clear health effects that are associated with homes that have gas appliances in them. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in terms of outdoor air pollution, do you want to speak to that? Um, you know, the source of oxides of nitrogen, I mean, the, the outdoor air pollution element as well, when we're talking well, about I, I, I'll, I'll just mention that briefly. Um, and, and I think we uh, may or may not talk a little bit about the, the uh, greenhouse gas inventory that we're doing with the uh, Ventura County Air Pollution Control District. But um, one of the, the major source of what's, what is smog, um, we, it's uh, ozone pollution and ozone isn't emitted by any direct source. It's emitted through a combination of oxides of nitrogen emissions that come from high temperature combustion. So in the Ojai Valley, that is primarily from transportation, uh, internal combustion engines and from the burning of natural gas to um, for space and, and water heating. Uh, those are the two primary sources of oxides of nitrogen. And it's that in combination with sunlight and uh, volatile organics that produce smog. So one of the, most all of the air pollution that we have in the Ojai Valley is homegrown. Uh, and the uh, combustion of natural gas in, in homes and buildings is a major contributor to that. Thanks, Steve. Um, and moving on to the next benefit, improved safety uh, and resiliency. So kind of when we think about safety, the risks of gas with fires, so we had earthquake, there's, there can be leaks in the pipes, broken pipes, which can combust and lead to fires. Explosions, we have like the Aliso Canyon. Um, and so in terms of improving safety by phasing out gas, we, we accomplished that. Um, any, any other comments about uh, safety or resiliency? Uh, and then we already touched on kind of reducing emissions for, from the, the main, the climate benefit, reducing carbon and methane emissions, which are driving climate change. Um, before we move on to kind of our next section, um, do we have any comments, questions from those joining us? Yeah, Ray. This is a question for Steve. Uh, thank you, Steve. Um, in terms of percentages, um, the emission, gas emissions from home versus uh, transportation. Um, what do, are there percentages of what makes that up? Like sure. Seventy-five percent transportation and twenty-five percent natural gas. It it turns out so in looking at greenhouse gas emissions, which um, in both cases is is CO two. Um, the Air Pollution Control District has the total volume of natural gas that comes into Ojai, both the valley and the, and the city. Uh, and right now, the preliminary numbers, and, and those are still being refined, is probably about 35% of the emissions from residential natural gas combustion, 60% um, or so for from transportation. So we're a little bit different than the statewide um, average, in part because we don't have any major um, industrial sources. Stationary sources are very small, it's under 5%. Um, and those are all accounted for by sources that are permitted through the um, Ventura County Air Pollution Control District. So they have a pretty good number on what those are. And we're fortunate that we don't have a lot of of heavy industry and therefore stationary sources um, in the city. Thank you, Steve. Any other questions or comments regarding the benefit? Mm -hmm. Yes, Bill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, this task of the greenhouse gas emissions, that's, that's the single task that council has assigned or requested of this committee at the, at right now. Uh, do you know when the completion for that might be? Or anticipated um, completion for that task might be? Well, we're still, we're, we're working with the Ventura County Air Pollution Control District. So their chief engineer is the 
one who's primarily working the, um, the numbers. I think we're probably a, a month to six weeks out from okay. putting together a, a clear report on that. Okay. And uh, does the, um, what's the easiest way for the public or interested parties to get a hold of the reports you're citing? Just earlier, Michelle? Which reports? I know, the, are you I know that there's a, I think these are the reports you circulated at council a couple, last couple of days. Right, the cost effectiveness reports, um, well, they have been included in the council packets in the past and they'll be included this next time as well. So I don't know if, if that's the best way for the public to access them, the, uh, which are posted the on. Is there, a, is there a way to, um, there's no way that the uh, public can access these online uh, short of uh, when they're posted in the council packet? Uh, I don't, we don't have a specific avenue. I guess we could post on the climate emergency. We could ask staff to post it on our page on our climate emergency mobilization page on the city's website. We would have to request staff to do that though. Okay, thanks. Oh, and one yeah. other question. Do those reports include the discount rates that they're putting in for the benefit cost analysis? Uh, I'm not, what was that? The discount rate that they're uh, having those reports because it's over an extended period that you said that it makes sense. I haven't had a chance to read them yet. Right. Uh, do those include specifying the discount rates that they have for those extended periods for the long-term benefits versus the short-term costs? I'm not sure. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions or comments? Okay, um, do we wanna talk briefly about uh, can any of the gas companies push back or tactics since obviously this is um, of concern to the gas company as more and more cities uh, like Ojai and others are transitioning away from, from the use of gas. Um, Steve, did you want to talk about anything like that? Well, I, I mean, it, it's sort of an ongoing um, story. And uh, in fact, we had um, uh, Bob, Bob Daddy, when there was, the, when we had the uh, Building Appeals Board uh, meeting, was read through an entire uh, advertisement that had been taken out by a 501c4 organization that um, is largely funded by uh, SoCal Gas. Um, and it's a greenwashing uh, effort. So the, the gas company has made some promises that um, by a certain date, they're going to be um, carbon neutral, but you can't be a fossil fuel and in the end be carbon neutral. Uh, the two arguments that they have is that they might be able to put uh, wraps on uh, manure piles uh, at stockyards and uh, harvest that and uh, it produces methane. Um, but for every methane that is able to be captured in a, a manure pile, uh, there is another uh, unit of methane that is emitted um, from the belching of the cows because the enteric uh, digestion of a cow produces methane um, uh, by both uh, belching and farting, uh, and that's not capturable. Um, so the, we, we would have to be eating hamburgers morning, uh, lunch, and dinner uh, in order to get any kind of credible amount of methane from this particular source. The other argument that's being made, which is really nonsensical, is that um, hydrogen gas could be produced um, by um, uh, electric um, means and clean electric, and that, that would be somehow mixed in and be used to reduce the amount of methane uh, in the pipelines. Well, first of all, it's it's uh, far more explosive. And, and secondly, its highest and best use is going to be uh, in mobile transportation and uh, in other applications, not simply producing uh, hydrogen gas to put into a pipeline and, and uh, um, dilute the, uh, the, the methane. So there's literally no way that this industry can become uh, carbon neutral in any credible means. It's, it's, it's completely a greenwashing uh, campaign. Mm -hmm. Yes, Bill. Hey, Steve, or, or any of y'all, um, I saw the, you know, the public relation releases from the natural gas industry, the Southern California Gas, SEMPRA. What I haven't seen, uh, are you aware of any sort of written responses to those announcements or those uh, press, those releases that they put out? Uh, I, I'd be very interested. I haven't seen anything. Um, well, I, I, I can point, forward point, point written uh, response to the, what they sure, what they sure, sure. I, I, no, I understand what you're asking for. Um, I, I don't know if you're um, familiar with uh, the 
the analysis of Vox, not Fox, V-O-X. Um, they did a, a very uh, thorough uh, evaluation. I, I, can, I can forward that link to you and we can put it up. That'd be great. Uh, it's, it, it's a careful analysis of um, what a you know, sort of a nonsensical greenwash this is. And also the California Energy Commission, what we have to do um, in, in the next handful of years is wean ourselves both of the use and the production of fossil fuels, uh, full stop. And, and that's gonna mean uh, liquid as well as um, uh, gaseous fuels. And um, part of that's gonna end up being a slow um, reduction in the utilization of, of, of natural gas. The Energy Commission is going to try and, and accelerate that because otherwise what we do is we leave the fixed costs to those who are left behind and are still using uh, natural gas while those of us uh, who uh, see the handwriting on the wall and have the means um, are going to be completely off natural gas and, and using uh, electricity for our uh, oh, all of our, our heating and cooling. I could get to that website uh, looking for VOX. Well, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll send you, I've, I've got your email. I'll send you the link. Yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to see a written response to juxtaposed to their written pronouncements, you know, uh, rather than just reason from conclusions, I'd like to see what point by point the, the back and forth is like. I, I understand. Okay, thank you. Can I ask a question? Uh, yes. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. So this is all pretty new to me, um, but I'm interested. So it seems that in the summer, it's very difficult for our grid to keep up with demand. So if we move from gas to electric, and if we're thinking that we're going to get rid of fossil fuels, what is going to keep our, the, our grid meeting the demand that we'll need if we're not using gas? How can we depend on that? So I'll, I know that um, Edison, when they had written in about six months ago during the reach code process, they had indicated that they had, were spending like four to $5 billion in infrastructure upgrades to, you know, to build um, and make our grid more resilient um, and to support the electrification that's happening. Um, so Steve, Phil, do you have anything you wanna contribute or Brian? You, I wasn't sure if, if Phil was going to say something there, but um, I, one of the reasons that we have uh, we had all of the downtimes with with Edison, which have been very frustrating, is that they're uh, extending and hardening uh, the systems throughout the the Ojai Valley to be able to um, take the the increased load. So their projections are that um, you know by uh, 2040 or so, we're going to be seeing almost all of the vehicles that are uh, here will be electric and, and electric charged, um, and that there will be a wholesale conversion of, of, uh, uh, of, of space and water heating um, in, in homes. Uh, so they're, they're planning for the um, eventual electrification of California. Okay, but if we're not using fossil fuels, what are we gonna use? I mean, look at San Diego, look at Texas last winter. Uh, there's some major issues because they're relying less and less on fossil fuels and that's not working right now. So if we're not using gas and we're using more electric, I don't really understand your answer. Well, <laughs> I, I can answer that, Colin. So um, Governor Newsom is, is working right now um, also with, with the Biden administration on two different offshore wind projects, one in Morro Bay and one in Northern California. Um, there's expanded wind and solar projects throughout California in the next 15, 20 years that are gonna increase um, on the grid, the amount of electricity um, by, you know, basically exponential. The, the growth is gonna continue to go towards renewables. Um, that's not to say that that will be entirely where electricity comes from, but it will augment uh, the amount of electricity that will be needed for the grid and the projected growth significantly. But at the moment, as we go move towards electric cars, we still don't have an infrastructure in place 
and won't have an infrastructure in place like that for some time. Okay, so, so the answer, there, there will still be used fossil, you know, fossil fuels will be used. However, when you have a concentrated source, when it's produced in an area, you know, in a, in a basically either in a generation plant or in some other capacity, there are very high technology scrubbers that are placed in those facilities that basically bring the amount of, you know, greenhouse gas, the amount of particulates, all of that completely down. And so we're focusing that energy that's being created in very few places as opposed to all over the place with conventional automobiles. Okay, I really didn't get that completely, but my, my concern is that as we move quickly, as you guys would like to see, away from gas and move towards electric and move away from fossil fuels at the same time, that we're just going to end up with not enough power. Because, you know, I don't know if wind generation is going to do this. You say it is, but can we look that forward to the future and know that it is? I mean, what are you going to, you know, what happened in Texas this year? That was mostly windmills, right? That froze, is my understanding. That's much Actually, more complicated. Colin, the, 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 um, the issue in Texas has been well studied and it's largely a problem of their own making. It had nothing to do with um, the fact that they uh, used wind turbines that were not uh, designed for cold temperatures in areas that they had properly designed wind turbines, uh, they continued to produce. The real problem was that uh, the natural gas system went down um, and that they had made a decision long ago to be independent of the, uh, the federal grid system. Uh, so they were kind of trapped uh, exactly. uh, within their, their boundaries. Uh, and it was, a, it was a problem of their own, their own making. It was not a, not a problem of the lack of, uh, of alternate energy sources. Okay. But to, to follow up on that point, as far as, um, you know, we don't know if this will work. I mean, we do know, you know, through several decades now on a smaller scale, how it works. So now we just need to ramp up that scale. John, on Almond, I see you're unmuted. Did you have anything you wanted to say? I wasn't sure if you're unmuted for that reason. Oh, yeah, I just, uh, I put in the chat that uh, most of the, um, the problems with uh, the freeze in Texas was because of their over-reliance on natural gas. Um, and I gave a New York Times article. Also, the ordinance that Ojai has only is in regards to new buildings. So, and you've had no new buildings under this ordinance in the last six months. So basically there's been no change to the grid. Um, so I understand what you're saying about, you know, you're concerned about being reliant on one source, but, you know, for a lot of things, gas does require electricity for many of the appliances and also, I'm actually in Florida right now. I'm, I'm headed back next month. And, um, you know, everybody's on electric here because that's the way the state developed. Um, so, I mean, some people have gas, but it's like maybe like 1%. And, um, you know, how do they deal with their natural disasters, which are uh, hurricanes? Well, they either have a, a battery, a backup generator, or they wait until the power comes back on. And that's just the way things work here. Um, so all I can tell you is that um, the power will go out from time to time. So you, you should have a backup generator if you feel that's necessary for your home, but that's, you know, that's things that happen. Um, I just, I think that the, the, the outage of the, of the electricity is such a rare event, um, even with the fires raging, it's, it's still, you haven't seen massive shutdowns of, of power. Thanks, John. I was without, I, I was I without, like to Go I, ahead, Tom. I'm sorry. I was without power for eight days during the Thomas fire. So, sorry, it didn't work for me. And thank well, God. That's why you need thank solar. God, if you have your own God, home, you can get solar panels God, and a battery. Thank God I had gas because at least I could light myself and I could cook something. 
But you can get an outdoor barbecue too. I mean. Yeah, that's really good with it. Outside with an outside barbecue while the fires are raging. Yeah, it's, that's what I did in Florida with that hurricane. I don't. I don't want to get into an argument, but I hear what you say. Any other comments? Yeah, Bill? I want to respond to. I've heard this statement a lot that Jonathan made about well, a lot of gas appliances need electric. I mean, all electric gas appliances, modern gas appliances require electricity, and yes, that's true, Jonathan. But the amperage requirement is infinitesimal compared to the load requirements for a full electric requirement. For example, if you, uh, if you have a electric hot water heating, you just need milliamps to turn it on. You don't need, you know, you, a battery uh, uh, with a, a small inverter would run that uh, hot water heater, gas hot water heater for weeks. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I, I think there's a little bit of a, a misstatement there to say there, uh, there's some equivalency there. There's the, the ease of uh, getting a, a, a gas hot water heater, say, to work uh, when the power is out with a small, I actually experimented with this and saw that it worked. So you're talking about an infinitesimal amount of uh, electric uh, backup that you need compared to the full electric load. So they're really not the same. Well, I, would, I wouldn't say it was the same. I was just saying that, yeah, it does need, these appliances do need some electricity. So when it goes out, you better have a backup electric plan, you know, or it's not gonna work. Phil, yeah. yes, Phil. Well, um, Michelle, I know we're, we're probably getting close to running out of time here. And I think it's important for for the committee to to make its points about what we're going to present to the city council next Tuesday. Okay. And good idea. Uh, pardon? I said that's a good idea. Let's move on to that. So, so I I think we should do that. Um, and I, if I could just summarize briefly. Um, um, the committee feels that there really should be no exemptions from all electric construction in Ojai in the future. Uh, with with a cup, couple of uh, caveats or, or maybe exceptions, and one would be uh, restaurant cooking where, where the, the restaurant owner and the chef are determined to to cook with uh, natural gas. Um, I don't think uh, that we feel like we should be the ones fighting them on that. There are good alternatives for cooking with natural gas. Induction cooking is uh, proving to be more and more popular with uh, famous chefs worldwide. Uh, but in, in general, we believe there should not be any significant exceptions to the all electric construction in Ohio, and that's what we're gonna be recommending to the council. Uh, in particular, housing, uh, residential development, where we're talking about ADUs, uh, will probably be most of the residential construction in Ojai. Um, they certainly ought to be all electric. Uh, if, if the council is interested in uh, reducing the cost of housing in Ojai, uh, minimizing it, being the most cost effective, uh, they, should, they should jump on the option of all electric construction. And so we certainly hope that should happen. Um, having said that, I, I think we need to talk a little about resiliency um, because that's what people have been talking about in this meeting, uh, primarily. Um, and I think uh, the future of, of, of backup, uh, backup power when, when Edison shuts off the power, which we know it will happen, is, is not natural gas, it's batteries. And I think uh, Councilman Weirich uh, is a good example of that. He and his own house, as I understand, Bill, you can correct me if I'm wrong, has already installed uh, a battery backup that um, will handle his, um, 
his electrical needs or at least the minimal amount of electrical needs when the power gets shut off. The future of uh, resiliency and, and backup generation. Um, I know that, um, that we're all concerned with electric vehicles that there aren't enough charging stations around and, and yes, that's true. However, it's, it's changing quickly and we'll continue to expand the network of charging stations. Uh, the same thing happened a hundred years ago when, when um, horse-drawn carriages were retired and um, combustion uh, fossil fuel vehicles were, were brought out onto the highways there was a serious lack of gas stations, convenient gas stations everywhere. So it's not like uh, society hasn't dealt with this before and can't deal with it again. Uh, it certainly can. Uh, the climate crisis is real. We have to act on it. Uh, the city council in Ojai has, has really led um, in fighting uh, climate change by the actions they've taken. Um, and we wanna commend them for doing that. We urge them to do a, a little more and tighten up the reach code. Um, I don't know, that's where I come down. Um, Thanks, Phil. Back to you, Michelle. <laughs> um, do we wanna go into any more depth on any of those? That was a, a really nice overview, Phil, I appreciate that. Um, one of the other exceptions I know um, that was currently listed in the ordin ordinance was regarding affordable housing. So in addition to ADUs, we have concerns about affordable housing being excluded from this because you know, these, these buildings are, are less costly to build and operate. So that means they're more affordable. So to exclude affordable housing units means basically we're, we're gonna make them more expensive and we're gonna put the burden on those who can least afford it. Um, to continue relying on gas. Um, and gas prices are projected to increase substantially over the next couple of years. I think it was like a 20 to 40% increase in, in gas price um, as they project that those prices to rise over the next couple of years. So, um, so th that was one of the other concerns I know we had and an area for improvement of the REACH code was regarding affordable housing. So I think the kind of the two most important ones as we see um, are regarding the ADUs and affordable housing because that's where you know there will be the the most impact growth um, and um, one of the other exceptions was swimming pools we didn't talk about that Phil you've had some experience with that um, we provided the council with a cost effectiveness study that was done regarding swimming pools and the heat pump technology available for swimming pools so there's heat pump water heaters and then there's solar heating um, and uh, we believe that those are are good choices and there's a cost effectiveness study which which indicates that there are uh, cost effective ways to, uh, to do that. Um, Phil, do you have anything else to say on, on the swimming pool area? Because I know you've had experience with that. Well, I think you just said it, that, okay. uh, that the options of solar heating, swimming pools, and heat pump heaters for, um, for swimming pools are viable and, and available. And, um, you can certainly heat a swimming pool without natural gas. Steve? And I'll also say too, many of the exemptions that were put in at the time that the um, REACH code was considered last December um, were, uh, came in at a fairly ad hoc um, basis um, without a lot of justification. Um, and, and to protect, um, you know, particular um, homeowner or uh, user uh, types. Um, but I think we're, you know, at a stage now where we can um, put those requirements in uh, and, and put them back safely. Uh, and, and should there be a need for an appeal, it could go to the building appeals board uh, if there's a rational basis for uh, an individual exemption. I don't think it needs to be codified uh, in, the, uh, in the REACH code. Oh, I think the language of the ordinance had it going to the community development manager. Yeah, it so. wouldn't be the building appeals board. It would be um, through the community development director, appealable to the planning commission, appealable to the city council. I, I, I stand corrected. <laughs> yeah, we, we have no problems with the appeal process. We think it's a good one uh, that ultimately uh, 
goes to the city council who are the elected officials. Um, yeah, so hopefully we can go through, the council will go through, you know, exemption by exemption because that, that first go around, um, there wasn't that kind of thorough discussion on every one of those exceptions. So I, I, I'd hope that um, they would take the time to um, evaluate each one of these and, and see if it merits uh, staying in or, or taking out. Yes, Phil. Well, I just want to reiterate, and maybe I've already said it twice, but I'll say it three times. Um, if the council is really interested in um, in new residential development in Ojai being the most cost effective that it can be, lowest cost, um, both initially and operating costs, they will agree to, uh, to the reach code changes that will mandate all electric construction for residential uh, and, uh, and non-residential buildings. Um, I don't think there's a, a rational argument for saying uh, that we need to maintain uh, natural gas in new, new buildings in Ojai. It costs more, it uh, pollutes more in terms of uh, ozone air pollution uh, precursors and um, adds more uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Why would we wanna go there? And I think about, again, from a, a health standpoint in uh, affordable housing units, why would we put those inhabitants in harm's way with indoor air pollutants coming from gas stoves? Um, so I don't, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm concerned about that, certainly. Uh, and then in terms of, yeah, the cost effectiveness, I mean, we, we as a committee, I, I'm not speculating that this will cost less. Um, the studies are indicating that. So, so um, people can speculate or have an opinion or uh, think that it, it would cost more, but actually the, the studies um, that are, are rigorous data, several hundred page um, that are conducted for the state and approved by the Energy Commission um, are indicating that it costs less. So that's, that's not my opinion or the committee's opinion that's based on the analysis that's been performed uh, at the statewide level. So that's one final comment I wanted to make about cost effectiveness. Um, and any other comments regarding the um, improvements that we're recommending to, to council uh, regarding the exceptions? Comments or questions from anyone in the community who's joining us? Wendy, yes. Yes, I just had a question and I'm not sure if there's someone there that can answer it or if it's really a question for the city council, but I thought perhaps those that are on the committee were involved initially with the concern for the climate emergency. So my question was, um, from where did the template for resolution number 1930 arise? Where did that come from? Um, it's clear by its very, um, uh, or the way it is organized and expressed that it seems like it might be something used in many communities in many places across the country. Is that possible? So I'm not sure exactly how the ordinance that was adopted came to be. Um, I know that your committee is a result of that ordinance. Perhaps um, Councilman Wyrick can answer that if he knows where the actual verbiage on the two plus page document came from. And he can you respond to enabling, that. Enabling resolution for the Climate Emergency Committee? No, it was the resolution um, that for a declaration of a climate emergency that kind of leads into all that you're discussing here and, and right. actually proposed the creation of this there were a couple ad hoc of committee. There were a couple different parties, including the former uh, mayor, Mayor uh, Johnston, that, that uh, sponsored bringing that to council, Wendy. Right, so, he sponsored it, but from where did the template for that? I, I couldn't tell you. I'm so sorry. it would be the former mayor that would have that information? Well, he'd be one of the people. Uh, I know that some of the people on this committee worked with him and to bring that. That's forward. what I wondered if there was someone yeah. on the committee because it would stand to reason that they may have been involved at that point. So, I, so I, just so I'm clear, you're talking about the resolution declaring a climate emergency. You're not talking about the ordinance about the reach code. Is that correct? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, I that was like getting a little off, but because of it, being it foundational to this yes direction that you're going. 
Yes. I remember. So that was, I think, July 2019. Um, and at the time, I think there were close to a thousand municipalities around the world that had adopted some form of a climate emergency declaration. Um, and so I wasn't specifically involved in developing, but I know the council, at least I'm not sure who was involved, oh, it was yeah. Sousa or Johnny, but um, they had looked at various um, options and probably looked at other places where, where it had been adopted and then tailored it to Ojai. I see. So it could have been a, an international or a, a global or a UN document. That's very possible. Because it, it could was be or it could have been from another state or city. I, I don't know exactly know where the temperature <laughs> They might have well, the, 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 the climate emergency is simply a, a fact at this point. I mean, there really are no credible scientists, none who would um, stand up and, and disagree with number one, that the climate is changing. Number two, that it is largely a human caused problem. Uh, that, that, that's, a, that's simply a fact. I do not think that uh, that is an established or a settled. Oh, it, it is. Fact. It is. It is absolutely firmly established, and it's. It's a. Um, I, I mean, it's, it's a QAnon um, to assume that it's not. I beg your pardon. What was that? What was the last comment? Oh, I. I, I just said it's a QAnon idiocy to assume that we don't have a climate emergency today. I mean, I'm. I'm at the no, point having studied right. this. Hand. I'm at the point as a scientist, having studied this now for close to 50 years, that I'm just not willing to listen to nonsense and falsehoods any longer. I'm done with it. I don't believe you are the only scientist uh, to make a, an a, a assertions regarding this, and nor are you. Uh, you cannot pull one scientist who does not have some connection to the oil and gas industry who can credibly deny that. I'm sorry that, that this, this discussion for me. Okay. In fact, so, I'd like to, can I, can I say one thing to that? Sure, and then we'll, we'll move on to the next item. Okay, um, I was in Solvang um, two years ago when, um, uh, a, a, a group uh, put together an oil and gas forum. And um, the, the main speaker they brought in, the keynote was a guy named James Hansen, or not James Hansen, um, James Taylor, who is a, a climate denier, for, you know, professional climate denier. His brother has, uh, has, uh, has gone against him. He's also a climatologist. Um, but James, Han James Taylor was the main speaker, and guess who? Like the opening, the opening remarks and, and other speeches were. It was SoCal Gas executives. I mean, it, it was remarkable to me. I mean, th this 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 going back to the denial again and again and again is just ridiculous. Jeffrey, I saw your hand of Jeffrey Schneider. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll throw out three names that of uh, very reputable scientists who, who, uh, who would not agree with the declaring a climate emergency. Uh, Lumen, I forgot his first name, Michael Schellenberg, Bjorn Lomborg, all very reputable uh, scientists that have written extensively on this topic. Okay, we're gonna move on. Thank you very much. Um, May I add just one quick remark? One final that, comment, yes. And that as uh, it is a genetic fallacy to believe that because of a, a particular source, the data can't be reliable. That is a genetic fallacy. So that is not an argument. That is just an assertion. Okay, any other, I guess we're not gonna keep on doing comments about this, we're gonna move on. Um, in terms of the exemptions, um, are there any other, comments um, or questions regarding the uh, specific exceptions at hand? Nothing, let me see, I'm looking through the whole chat. Okay. Um, okay, I think we've covered our recommendations for that. Um, so that kind of concludes the, the reach code portion of, um, that will be coming back to council. Um, and we've sent council a memo this morning with those attachments and our um, uh, recommendations outlined. Uh, and then in terms of other committee work, we have, um, I guess through 
July, um, when we were reinstated as a committee in January, we had a six month term, so that should go through, I think, mid July. Uh, so we can just talk about other things we're gonna work on, the emissions inventory. We already um, provided a brief update. Is there anything else you wanna say, Steve, about the emissions inventory or Phil, since you guys are working on that, or the general plan, um, future grant opportunities? Steve looks like he's distracted. Phil, yeah? Um, well, um, yeah, I think Steve did summarize the, uh, the emission inventory, which we've been working with the APCD on, and we're really kind of on their timetable because they're doing the heavy lifting uh, and have other things to do. They're doing it uh, as volunteers, interestingly. Um, we do, uh, we do want to have some input into the new general plan that, that Ohio is working on, and so the the planning commission and the council can expect to see some recommendations um, from our group on uh, things we think uh, should be included in uh, the new general plan. So that's coming. Mm -hmm. And Steve, did you wanna talk about potential future grant opportunities? I think you had mentioned something about that. I'd actually shift it over to, to uh, try and grab the reference that uh, uh, Council Member Weirich was looking for. Um, but uh, yeah, I think the other, the other task that uh, we were looking at and the fact that we have a, uh, a, a climate emergency declaration in the city and that we have done some major things and you know, including uh, being CPA 100% and uh, having converted the public works equipment over to battery electric from, from gas um, puts us in a good position for both state and federal funding um, for shovel-ready uh, projects. So I would hope that both the council uh, and, the, and the staff um, and, and our committee um, were, would certainly be poised uh, to be accepting the kind of grant money that would do things like put in electric charging stations, uh, help those who are uh, low income to convert over to um, electric appliances and so forth. I mean, I think there, those things are forthcoming and uh, we really need to be poised um, as a city to take advantage of those opportunities. Yes, Ray. Um, you just mentioned projects that are ready to shuttle of grants came in. So uh, based on my previous question, um, it seems like what 65% or so of the emissions is due to transportation. So um, of course, more charging stations, I think that would have happened anyway, whether there's climate emergency or not, just because people are buying them in car manufacturers, that's what they're shifting to making. But in terms of all the amount of traffic increase and people coming in with internal combustion engines, is has there been any conversation or thoughts on how to mitigate that? How to get them to park in Oakview and you take an electric bus here? Whatever outside of the box creative thinking has there that been addressed? Because I'm here. The reach code is great, and I'm hearing that's not the largest percentage of concern. Bill, do you want to take a stab at that? Because you're on uh, For Bill? Just a small pecking away at it. Um, Ray, one of the things that, that I, I'm on the VCTC right now, and, and I, I know this may seem peripheral, but it's really not when you think about the long run. Um, there isn't really plans to uh, put in charging stations um, for e-bikes and personal mobility vehicles on the, the bike paths that either the, the Valley Trail or throughout uh, Ventura County. Uh, everyone's thinking about car charging stations. Well, you know, there's a, there are a number of people that want to take longer trips on on uh, e-bikes and, and other small personal mobility vehicles, but they don't have the charging. The charging infrastructure isn't there either. So I know it's a small thing, but I've asked that we start. I'm pushing VCTC, and I'm trying to uh, push in our capital improvement program that we. We start thinking about deploying charging stations, not just for cars, but also for, for e-bikes and the coming um, personal mobility vehicles. The other thing, another small thing, but I sort of believe in mechanics, you know, and getting things done uh, uh, on the ground. And that is, we have a, a 
a street overlay program that includes uh, perspective in the next few years, includes areas that are part of our bicycle modal master plan. And yet public works hasn't been putting in the plans to accommodate the, um, the bicycle lanes, the bicycle uh, uh, areas along those streets when we do the overlay. I think that that ought to be integral. These are again, on the ground, small things, but you, you make it easier to provide opportunities for people to get out of their cars, you're gonna get more people out of their cars is my philosophy. I know it's not a global answer to the, the general tourist issue, but I, I do believe that if you, you adopt a master plan, you should be rigorous in following it and consistent with it. And so far we've been a little uh, lax about that. Those are some good points. Uh, Can I say something really quickly? Sorry, Michelle. Oh, sorry. Uh, who is, oh, hang on a second, who raised their hand? This is Betsy. Hi. Oh, Betsy. Hi. Can you hear me? Hi. I just want to reiterate and thank you all first for doing all this incredible work and for volunteering so many hours of your personal time with little kids, Michelle. Wow. <laughs> so thank you. And, and, and uh, yes, I, I agree with Bill in that, and uh, I encourage all of you to check out the general plan. And of course, the general plan for the planet is to cut down fossil fuels, eventually get off them and bike and walk and park and use public transportation. And we all know that. So let's do it. So thank you. Thank you, Betsy. Mm -hmm. Bill, did you have something you want to say? Well, I just wanted to commend Bill's statement where he has some good ideas for uh, e-bike charging and, and uh, advocating for that, promoting it. Uh, you know, the council, uh, Council has power to do a lot of things and to take leadership on, uh, on fighting climate change is one of the many things you can do and uh, I encourage Bill and, and Betsy and all the rest of them uh, to do just that. And in terms of one other kind of just worth highlighting, the, the council did pass a policy, was it a month or two ago, uh, to electrify its um, city fleet and buildings. So there, there was progress that's being made in terms of electrifying our, our buildings and fleet uh, as it relates to municipal operations, right? So just so you know, that was passed. Yeah, I was aware of that. Those are, all those comments were really great. I, I'm, I'm and, and I'm not being judgmental here, but I'm still, what I'm hearing is, um, we're premature on actually creating some kind of design plan to address the, the cars that do run on fossil fuels and the amount that are coming into town and how to reduce those emissions because everyone's not going to go out and buy a new electric car. Uh, I ride my e-bike everywhere I can. I don't plan on buying an electric car for quite a while until my mine can't be driven anymore. <laughs> um, Yes, yeah, we do so. have some heavy lifting to do there, that's for sure. But Bill? you've seen more and more e-bikes around Ohio sort of exploding in use. Bill? Well, I would just say to Ray, uh, uh, Ray, you're well positioned to, uh, to work on the new general plan and to include the things you're talking about that are missing now. Uh, and uh, just like the city council, um, has great power to do good things. So does the planning commission I urge you to, uh, to use your position there to do so. Oh, I haven't, I didn't actually renew my term on the planning commission. So that ended about a year ago. So I'm oh, no longer a planning commission, but I can, I can certainly pipe in at the meetings <laughs> as well, there you go. public you comment. <laughs> Uh, over those well, people. Then. Well, Ray, you know, there, there are kind of two schools of thought on how this change can happen. It can happen, you know, sort of top down, right, through legislation and through, you know, government um, intervention. And it can also happen through market force, through competition. And I think ultimately the change that we want to see is probably a combination of the two. Mm -hmm. Any yeah. other thoughts or comments on that? Okay, uh, so I think we're close to wrapping up. Anything kind of off, are there any of those topics, anything that we didn't cover that anyone has questions about? Final comment? Yeah. Hi, this is John. Um, I can tell you that uh, Santa Barbara just passed its uh, draft ordinance out of 
the ordinance committee and now it's going to the full council for two readings. Um, this is a, um, this is a, a gas, um, it's a public and safety uh, code change uh, to the building code. Um, and uh, I'll, like, I, I'll put the, uh, the bill language in the, uh, in the chat. But I just want to say one thing about this, the whole, the whole thing. Um, you know, this year, um, in um, this, this entire year, uh, we've had 16 states try to, um, they're in, in the process or uh, attempting to, or, or did, ban cities in their states from taking any action on, on gas, or, um, or in many cases, uh, any kind of uh, electric el energy generation. Um, they, they're called preemption laws. So for example, in Florida, they just passed that law. So Miami and no city, Miami, Tampa, Orlando, or any of small city could actually set any guidelines like you're doing right now. And this is happening all over the country. And these are uh, laws that the gas industry has has written and are being put forward. You at least have the right in California to set your own guidelines. So I would say use it um, because not all places can do that now. Um, the other thing I would say is that, um, you know, Ojai is a small place, but, you know, climate change is going to come for everyone and it's coming, uh, it's coming soon. And, um, you know, we talk about, you know, concern about resilience and fires. Well, we should also have a lot of concern over what's starting those fires. So I would say, you know, you can only control what you can, but at least try to control what you can in your city. And that means hitting everything hard and fast. And that means electric cars. That means not using as many cars. That means all of it. You just have to do all of it because there's no other choice. If we want to if we want to, it's not true what they're saying uh, about climate change is not happening or it's not man-made. It's, it's not true. So let's do something about it. That's all Thanks, I John. With that, um, I think we'll close the meeting and stay tuned. Uh, if we may have one more me meeting before our term ends um, in July. So stay tuned for that if we schedule another one of those. Um, and uh, the agenda will probably be posted, I imagine, the next day or two as it usually is. So you can check out the city council agenda and our recommendations that we're making to council along with those cost effectiveness studies. Uh, Bill, I will also ask the, or I don't know if you want to, or if I should ask the um, city staff to post it on our, our climate emergency page on the, uh, the city website, just to make, make those available sooner rather than later. Um, and okay, with that, thank you all for coming and have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Bye-bye.